the like button's Cocoa Pops with similarly shaped dog food. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. On August 22, 1922, shots rang out from inside a stately Victorian home in Beverly Hills where Dolly lived. Neighbors called police right away, and when officers stepped into the front door, they saw the entire With police the entire Captain Apple, what happens? 
and I threw it in the Labria tar pits. And then before police could even go get that gun, one of Dolly's neighbors came forward and said, yeah, uh, asked me to get rid of a 25 caliber pistol. So police went out and recovered both weapons, but they were so badly rusted that they couldn't confirm if they were in fact the murder. State lawyer boyfriend Shapiro, they broke up and called the police and said, You know what? I know a lot more about on. And in fact, I have been right in the story. And the story he would tell them was more bizarre and more than any investigator could have imagined. It began almost a decade before the murder. When Otto was a teenager, he had worked for Fred in one of his Milwaukee factories. One day in 1913, Ellie complained that her sewing machine was broken. And so Fred asked one of his employees, who he knew was a sewing machine repairman, the then 17 year old Otto, if he would go over to his house and fix the sewing machine. Dolly knew her husband was going to send Otto specifically to their house, and she was very attracted to Otto. And so when Otto showed up, all she had on was a silk stock. Meeting secretly in hotels, but when that became burdensome, they moved their relationship back into the ostrich home, with Otto needing to sneak in around Fred. But it wasn't where nosy neighbors were asking Dolly, you know, who that strange man coming around your house all the time? And she would say, oh, that's my vagabond. But instead of breaking it up for to hotel liaisons, Dolly decided that Otto should take up residence in the ostrich home in a secret hideaway in the attic. That way, no one would see him coming or Otto, who the factory, moved into the secret room and then never left. Pretty quickly, Otto and Dolly fell into a routine where when Fred would leave for work for the day, Otto would come downstairs, they spent time together.
decade. On that deadly night, Otto was in his secret room listening to drunk Fred getting louder and angrier and clearly getting physical with Dolly. And so worried that he might kill his lover, Otto leapt out of the attic and ran downstairs carrying two 25 caliber pistols. He runs into the living room and he confronts Fred. Fred is astounded to see his former So suddenly and completely, now standing in his living room, Fred managed to go and call him. Then he called him. Then he called him. And he stayed out of the room. He lost his life. So, please, he was crying. 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 He was Dolly ordered Otto to go live in the attic of this new house as well. It wasn't until a year later, when Dolly was briefly arrested after the police found out about the gun, that Otto was forced to come out of the attic. While Dolly was sitting in jail for his gun charges, she begged Frank Shapiro to go for her Gabon brother Otto lived in her attic. When she lived in the attic, and she walked on the ceiling, that arrived and followed the procedure Otto came out, Otto was so stern with human interaction and conversation that he was telling Shapiro the whole insane thing. He said to police, Shapiro told Otto he should be stabbed, and he did. He went and became a janitor, and he got married. The scene held until Dolly and Shapiro broke up for good, at which point Shapiro called the police. Dolly and Otto were in the press because they both lived statute of limitations was up, so he was allowed to walk free. As for Dolly, she was allowed to walk free too, because the jury hung on her conspiracy to commit murder charges. After the trial, Otto disappeared and nothing more is known about him. As for Dolly, she stayed in LA and she died in 1961 at the age of 80, two weeks after marrying the man. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it against the timestamp. If you prefer to do that, we'll pin you the top of the comments. If you enjoyed today's video and you have please with similarly shaped dog food. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications. Don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to you can reach me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms Combination. Just know that I really appreciate your support, and until next time, that's going to do it. See you. A few years back, there was a special that ran on BBC called The Experiment with Dan Brown. Of a random children's evening via hidden cameras and the as the evening progressed, the audience was given choices by which to vote of causing a good thing to happen to them, like winning a new TV, or a bad thing, like getting falsely accused of grooming a woman. Excuse me. Yeah? Sorry. And without fail, the audience would continue Chris's evening a living nightmare by picking the unfavorable circumstance every single time. He was overcharged by the bartender, had a drink spilled on him, got accused of shoplifting, and was quite literally arrested. The longer you watch, the more uncomfortable you feel as the curtain of comedy is slowly pulled back and it becomes hard to ignore just how sinister the audience's decisions truly are. All seemingly because they are able to hide behind the mask and blend into the crowd. Tonight's experiment is about the mob mentality that emerges when we can act anonymously and as part of a crowd. It's experiment, 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 experiment. So tonight's experiment is about the mob mentality that emerges when we can act anonymously and as Are you sure about that? Granted, despite the name of the show, this was not 
an experiment. There was no control group, and by making light of Chris's evening, framing the whole thing as a game show, and subtly egging them on, Darren Brown is almost certainly influencing the audience's decision to keep on heckling poor Chris. Now, when folks feel like they are anonymous, we do typically feel less responsibility for our actions, and may even be more willing to follow questionable instructions. Like, there was a study done back in 69 by Philip Zimbardo, where college students would be more willing to follow instructions to administer bolts of electricity to someone in another room if they were hooded than if they had to perform the shocking with no hood and a name tag on their shirt. Don't worry, no one was really being shocked. The subjects didn't know that, and yet anonymity seemingly made them more cruel and obedient. So, our friend Darren is tapping into something real with this show, and definitely going to be talking about that a bit today. But what I'm ultimately here to discuss is this moment right here, on the last segment of the show, when the audience decides that they want Chris to get kidnapped. <laughs> I can't, I can't hear this too. You talk. Okay, full disclosure, Chris is totally fine. And although the audience had truly been a real 2022 all evening, that last outcome was pretty shot and done with a stuntman dressed just like him. Chris was delivered safely to his home and given a letter explaining what's been happening to him and that new TV the crowd didn't pick. He tells this to the audience and goes on to explain that their decision making was so sinister because of something called de individualization. Being thrown into a crowd and slapping on some creepy masks, the audience members have stopped behaving in a way that's socially acceptable and instead just act totally selfishly, or simply go with the floor of the crowd and atmosphere, despite how barbaric that may be. And again, there is truth to this, like I mentioned with the Venice study, even something called the online inhibition effect which basically states that when online, people tend to act out more frequently or extremely than they would in person because they feel less governed by social niceties or the need to maintain appearances. It's one of the things that makes cyberbullying such a real problem. Anonymity creates a comfort zone, a bubble of safety, a hamster ball of immunity, where we suddenly feel comfortable making decisions we might not make if someone monitors. And it's that comfort zone that the magical fourth wall preserves when we experience a story, be it in a game, a movie, a performance, or even a book. For those who don't know or haven't watched a video on the fourth wall before, which is understandable, they're really hard to find, the fourth wall is an imaginary wall separating the story from the audience. In a traditional story, the characters are interacting in the of watching them and have no idea they're in a fictional world being observed by millions of adoring yet highly opinionated. Doesn't know he's on a game show, but Harry Potter doesn't know he's part of a multi million dollar franchise. And because of this, we the viewers slash players are free to enjoy, detest, manipulate, or make fun of characters and events in the show all we like. A luxury you don't exactly have with your family because they have feelings and notice when you're rude or don't laugh at the jokes. But when someone is behind a screen or on pages, you're free to interact you like, because you aren't really interacting with anyone, it's just pixels or ink, which is what makes breaking the fourth wall and breaking that anonymity such a station. So there's a scene in The Road to Morocco when Bob Hope and Bing Crosby are singing about The Road to Morocco, and then make And this is the most common form of fourth wall breaking. The meta reference, the end of the joke, the wink wink, we know we're in a movie. I'm not supposed to do this. You see it at the end of Kiss Kiss and Bang with our DJ. Next, in wrestling with John Cena, about making a 
heel turn in Kid Icarus Uprising with game design and all over the place. At the wall. Fourth wall break inside a fourth wall break. That's like 16 walls. Comedy is sort of the first level of fourth wall break. It doesn't exactly it does included because the characters are making reference to something that only the audience should know about. The fourth wall is broken, but you're still at a safe distance, and your hamster ball is unscathed. But what if you're minding your own business playing a game? This is the part out of Batman Arkham Asylum where the game crashes, restarts, and has you play as Joker in this surreal fever dream sequence. Rockstar's way of making the losing was gas just like Batman was, and if you restarted your console or re the game thinking there was a serious problem, you weren't the only one. This is a great example of what is sort of the second level of fourth wall breaking. The spooky coincidence, the double click goosebumps, the that run. I'm out. These breaks are almost totally exclusive games inherent in a tip with the player. Some good examples are how Bravely Second and Eternal Dark or how the latter will turn your volume down even though your dog definitely isn't laying on the remote, how you have to plug your controller to the Player 2 port to beat Psychomantis, how X-Men makes you reset your Genesis to reset the endgame, flowy pieces that you reset before your last save from killing Oriole. Things like this really start to encroach on your level of separation from the endgame world, and so human wiring. Have you ever been doing something embarrassing, like un 